Welcome to the Draw Shops Get Genius Podcast, where we talk to today's business influencers to pick their brain and pull out their genius. It's time to get genius. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Get Genius. Today, I have a podcast expert and his name is David Ralph. And first, I just have to say that I'm in love with his accent. I am a sucker for the British accent. I even have it on my on my cell phone. That's my Siri. It's Jude Law. It's not really Jude Law, but I pretend that it's Jude speaking to me. Anyway, so doing this uh, interview, I felt like I had my my own Jude, except that David Ralph is an extremely attractive, possibly sexier than Jude Law. Wink, wink. This, this interview was super fun. I have to say that at the end of it, I actually got another piece of genius advice that I'm going to share with you now because unfortunately we didn't record it. Being the expert interviewer that David is and the podcast genius that he is and all the success that he's had, I felt a little bit under the gun like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm totally going to get critiqued here. And I got a little bit of critique at the end. And one thing he he said to me, and I hope that all of you can take this with your interviews or whatever it is that you do to connect with your audience, whether it's a podcast or writing or whatever it is, and, and you're and you're interviewing another expert, think of yourself as being on a date with that guest. It's like at the end of the night, and it's just you and that person having this amazing conversation. No one else is around, and you totally know because you've been there before, where it's like midnight, everybody's gone home, and you're left talking to this one person. And you're like, "Wow, this guy's so cool," or "She's so awesome," and you're just like, "Bam, bam, bam," with the questions and the answers and the engagement and conversation, and it's just that good. So. Um, I, I hope we have some of that in, in this interview. I think we have, I think we do have some of that, but, um, I want to bring more of that to, to all of you. So, um, as we discuss on this interview is, you know, creating a podcast, it's all about getting better and better the more that you do it. And David Ralph is such a great person on this because there, there are definitely a lot of coaches out there or businesses out there that say, I will take your podcast and we will make it a huge success and we will grow your audience and you'll get sponsorships and all that, you know, all those good promises. But, um, you know, David's kind of saying, I'm going to tell you some things that they're not telling you and some other things that you should focus on. And that's what we highlight in this interview. And I think it's really, really important. Um, He has a show himself. It's called Join Up Dots. And uh, the the whole theory of it is that he joins up the dots of his guests' lives, highlighting their failures and successes. And he's also extremely funny. Um, He got this from the quote from Steve Jobs, which is, you can only see your future by connecting the dots. He's extremely authentic. He has a cool story. He has some surprises in, in there in terms of his journey Um, from the beginning of podcasting, from before even podcasting, and from during his his podcasting. Um, There's a lot of things that I took away from this in terms of where you're at in life uh, and and really getting a check on, is this really what I want to be doing? Um, So I think think it's a really great interview. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And I'm happy for all the takeaways that you will get. So please enjoy. And if you like it, please share. Hello, David. Thank you for being on the show today. It is an absolute delight to be here. How often do you get a chance to spend time with lovely ladies when you're married? It's only in podcasting. That's the only time it happens. (laughs) Well, I, for one, myself, am extremely excited to to talk to you today because I think you're going to be able to answer a lot of questions that I have. I know that there's a lot of our guests that are in the process of starting up a podcast. Maybe they already have one. Um, And even if they don't, just in terms of engaging with your audience, I know that you're going to have some really brilliant tips. So um, with that, I kind of want to, I'm curious as to how you got into podcasting at all, what led you there, and then what made you say that this is the thing that I'm going to put my energy into. 
Well, it's, it's a really weird story, actually. And it's one of these stories that I'd actually become a podcaster and I'd done about 300 shows and then had this epiphany one day of how it actually started. And it wasn't the 300 show story that I'd been telling everyone. So in a sort of quick summary, I used to be a, a financial trainer. So I used to stand up and doing training courses for a load of people in an office. And when I started in this office, there was about 30 people. And when I left, there was about 400 people. And I was still the trainer. So when there was only me and 30, that was fine. I could spread my time around and be there and, and do the presentations. When it got up to about 400, I was a bit stretched thin. And so what I started to do, I thought, what I do, I make these little videos and so that people can see me. I record it on a webcam and then they can watch it at their desks. And then I'll strip the audio off and they can have me to listen to and they can do it at home and then we'll test them the next morning. And so I'd kind of learned the skills of being a podcaster before I'd actually ever thought about being a podcaster. And it wasn't until three days into my entrepreneurial leap when I quit my job to become a web designer. And after three days, I thought, I hate this. I hate making websites. I thought it was going to be good fun, but I'm just sitting at home on my own. I need some conversation. I'm bored. And then I thought, oh, there's these things called podcasts. I'll, I'll listen to those. That's like conversation. That's like having friends in the office with me. And I listened to three back to back. And on the third one, I thought, I could do this. I think this is this is something I could do and it all sort of fell naturally into place and that's where um, join up dots sort of came from I fortunately had this idea I had these skills I was used to talking and then sort of boom and yeah fortunately for me it went off very well summer so how how did it become so successful because that's kind of that magic question people start and they're hoping they, they record their first podcast they publish it and they hope that they get at least a few listeners <laughs> Well, it took time. It did take time. When I first started it, I, 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 with shame, I remember actually contacting Libsyn, which were the hosting account people, right. saying, you've got my stats wrong. My stats must be wrong. you know. And I look back on it and I think, no, it wasn't wrong. It was probably me clicking to see if it was testing. And that, that was all it was. But it, it just takes time. And so in the first year, I did 372 episodes of an hour long. I was going out every single day, bang, 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 bang. And you get better at it. And so in the first five weeks, I was on about sort of 45 a day and it just wasn't going up. And I thought, I just don't know what's happening. Then it started crawling up, crawling up, crawling up. Then it dropped again. But I just had it in my head, Summer, that if I kept on going, then an audience would grow. And I don't think my show really took off after about, you know, 11 weeks. So I must have done, what, uh, 90 shows, nearly 100 shows in that time. Then it started to sort of take on. So it does take time. And I think people are looking for the sort of magic ingredient. And I think, number one, it's good that no one's listening at the bo- at the beginning because you're not very good. And, you know, now I would say to people, because I've done nearly a thousand shows, come over and listen to me. And I'm quite proud of my efforts. But in right. the early days, I'm quite glad that nobody other than me was listening, really. So um, it's, it's not about growing an audience. It's about just doing it, doing it, doing it. But once you're good, once you're comfortable, then there are things that you can do to actually make that audience expand quite rapidly. So true. Um, Consistency is everything. And it seems like it can take forever. But you look back and you realize how how well it works for you. Yeah. I'm curious about... And it's, and it's not really, I just jump in there. It's not really forever. I know when you're doing it, you go, oh, it's taken a year. It's taken a two year, three years or whatever. But if you think to yourself, you know, you're starting from scratch, basically, you're creating a new venture. Are you willing to put the hustle in for three years so that the rest of your life is really good? I think everyone would do it. It's just why you're doing it. You really want it to speed through and it doesn't. Right. Exactly. What kind of marketing do you do to promote your podcast? Now I don't do anything. And this 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 was one of the things. I, I once again, I'm big on epiphanies and I'm big on enjoyment. So when I started it, I did used to post everywhere. And I used to post on Facebook and try to get Instagram going and Twitter and all the kind of things that most podcasters do. And I one day I was sitting there thinking, I hate this. I like the podcasting. I love the conversations, but I hate everything else about it. This is just not fun. And I was literally spending sort of eight or nine hours a day trying to promote and grow the audience. And so I just stopped. 
And I thought, right, I'm going to go a different way. But I don't know. How do I do this? How can I go against every single person? And so I didn't promote and I tried to break my audience. And what I mean by that, I tried to take it down to the lowest level where I knew naturally people were finding me. And then I started simply saying to people, if you like the show, share it with your mate or share it with your friend or get your girlfriend to listen to it. And people must have done because it started going up sort of exponentially. Um, And then once it got to a a decent point, I had another epiphany and it wasn't about Twitter and Facebook. I suddenly thought to myself, if you want a coffee, where do you go? You go Starbucks. If you want a uh, hamburger, you go to McDonald's. Where do you go for podcasts? Do you go to Facebook? No, you don't. So why are we putting it all into Facebook? Why are we putting it into Twitter? You go to like iTunes or Stitcher. So I started then looking at how that works and um, made making sure that I understood within a doubt how iTunes operated. Once you get that going, you don't have to promote. And so my show is just growing sort of every single day, really, based on that fact. So fantastic. <laughs> and so true, all of what you're saying. So what what you've learned, I'm sure, in these, you know, hundreds, over a thousand podcast episodes is how to create an engaging interview the kind that people actually want to share because you can ask them to share it but they're not going to share it unless they've actually yeah. gotten something from it how do you how do you manage to make that work each time I think I was quite lucky. Uh, as I say, I, I was used to doing stand-up presentations, so engaging content for eight hours a day. And so I was that used to- That is hard. Sort of, <laughs> it, well, it was hard. And I used to do it for sort of um, day after day after day after day, you know, five days a week. I used to start at eight o'clock and I'd finish at six and I'd be getting a room of people and then the next lot would come in and then the next lot would come in. And I'd have to keep that energy up. So when I started Join Up Darts, I thought, right, okay, I can do this. I do eight hour interviews back to back to back to back to back. And that's what I did. And people said, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you keep your energy up. But I think it was 20 years of training that led up to that. But I realized actually when I started, as we say in the United Kingdom, taking the mickey out of guests and actually sort of um, having a joke with them and sort of taking a piss really, that, <laughs> that's when the show started to come together. Um, and when the guests, and it wasn't easy in the early days because people thought they were going to come on to a certain show and then I was asking them you know what what color underpants do they wear and do they do this and do they do that but now I think people understand what my show is all about and so it's a lot easier to become engaging because they, they they're meeting me halfway um and you know that that's brilliant when they have already listened they know what they're going to get and they come on and you can sense it but in the early days it was a bit of a shocker for them so once again I just kept on doing it I just kept on doing it and I think some of the guests might have got a little bit annoyed others enjoyed it some thought it was a surprise but I kept on getting these emails from listeners saying oh this wasn't what I expected I clicked on it thinking it was going to be an entrepreneur show I wasn't expecting laughter and tears right. and I thought I'm on to, I'm on to something if, if I can get every single show being slightly different sometimes because of my lunacy sometimes because of the guests sometimes because of the deep story then we're on to a winner and so once again as I say at the beginning just kept on doing it keep on doing it keep on doing it and the sort of audience takes place and when when you think about it, Summer, when you hear the stories of like Seinfeld, for example, you know, global success show, and it didn't get an audience for like four series or something, you know, and cheers and all these things that we love looking back on it. Why should any podcast be expected to go off like a rocket and be a winner? It shouldn't be, you know, these multi-million pound TV corporations getting this top talent, getting these top actors, these top script writers, and they struggle. I think that most podcasts, um, podcasters out there are, are fooling themselves if they think that they can just turn on the microphone and be what the world wants. It's got to take time. Right, exactly. And people have to really start to feel connected to you and mm-hmm. like, like you're another friend of theirs. And you, you don't get that. Like you said, it's it's not from watching one episode of a TV show. You might like it and it causes you to listen again, but you don't really fall in love until you've been listening for a long time. And then that's what gets yeah. people to go, oh my gosh, you have to hear this and, yeah. and share it amongst everyone. So you, I imagine you have a lot of entrepreneurs as listeners and uh, you've got this great... I'm sure there's others as well because it's just so entertaining. But you have you have this great kind of theme that you continue with with all of your episodes. And you say um, you can only see the future by connecting the dots by Steve Jobs. 
And I think I think it's just so cool because you you kind of, that's what you do. You connect the dots of of your guests and you talk about their their failures and how it led to success. Um, and obviously you make you make some jokes in there. Some people tell their stories on my show and, and they're crying. Some people are laughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what what are some of your stories and and connect to the dots for us? Some some failures you might have had that led to success. Well, I, I fail every day. And I know that's a cliche that people say. But one of the things that I, I hate is people that call themselves an entrepreneur. You know, and my show is an entrepreneur podcast because we know what it means. But I think there's no such thing as an entrepreneur. It's just a, an idiot who is trying to learn every single day and sometimes makes a bit of money, sometimes loses a bit of money, but then has a, a little bit of a speed forward. And I think that's that's where it wins. So every single day I fail and I look back on it and I've wasted thousands of stuff. I've trusted myself with people. Um, I've opened my doors to communities and memberships that just didn't take on. And little by little, you get to the point where you realize what you need to do. And what I realized with my program was actually I was going to become more successful if I was able to do what I do without going online. Now, everybody says, right, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to have an online business. Ultimately, having that dream of sitting on a beach with a cocktail, but nobody's on that beach with a cocktail. They're all sitting there in their computer room with the curtains drawn because they can't see the screen with the sunshine getting whiter and whiter. And that's not the dream. That is not the dream. So I realized that I'd gone into that mode and I was spending hours upon hour upon hour on it. And my big failure, I suppose, but my big win as well, dependent on your viewpoint, was that I had burnout, but I didn't see it. So carried on burning out and then my hair started dropping out and once it, it sort of dropped out it's all come back now which is brilliant I didn't know that hair could drop out and come back wow. but I, re I realized that something was wrong and what it was that I was too obsessed I was too focused on everything where what I should have been was focused on the something, the 20%, the thing that makes a difference. So now, for example, my show goes out four times a week, but I only actually do it three days a month. And I literally hardly ever turn on my computer. And I only have clients who are willing to pay me a lot. Um, and that makes it easier. At the beginning, I thought I had to get like a thousand clients all paying me $10 a month, you know, because I couldn't see that there was people out there that were willing to pay money because my mindset wasn't like that. I'd come from earning a salary each month. And now I realize that it's not up to me to decide how much somebody's willing to pay. It's up to them. So I quote figures and some people say no, some people say yes. So I just have a lovely life. I have a lovely life where I'm hardly online at all. I rarely go into Facebook or social media. All I do is record my podcast and try and do it as well as I can. And as I say, focus on that 20%. And that 20%, if you can do it, brings about the 80% of the rewards and everything else sort of comes naturally. It's it's a bit of a rambling answer, but my failures and my wins are joined. I right. can't actually split split them at all because all of them have led me to this point now where, you know, I've just been in the Caribbean for um, 12 days. My daughter got married over there and um, I, I didn't have any internet or anything. And I just turned up off the business and walked away. And that's how I operate. I don't have to tell anyone I'm going. I don't have to do anything. I just do it. So I think that's a big win, isn't it, Summer? Oh, absolutely. It is. <laughs> So you have, um, and, and, and I know that you are obviously pro-podcasting for, for entrepreneurs in their business. Um, I love the fact that you now just do it three days a month but produce so much content. That's awesome. Um, you, you teach others how to, how to become great podcasters, and you kind of have this, you know, forget what everyone else is teaching you. This is how you do it. What, what are they going to learn? What's that, what's their experience going to be by taking that? And is it a, am I right in saying that it's a one day training or is it? No, it's, it's not. Well, before it was um, just online videos. Okay. And um, what I did, I created a thing called Podcasters Mastery and it was 300 plus videos and it was teaching people everything about being a podcaster. And it was it was a big mistake. There was too much content on it for them. And now I realize that people want a A to B. They want a journey to go on. And so I started thinking, right, what would be the big win for a podcaster? And my first thought was um, post-production. So a lot of people struggle and you hear nightmare stories about, oh, it takes me two and a half 
half hours each episode to edit it and stuff. So I thought, how can I get that as fast as possible? So my post-production now is about 19 seconds. So as soon as I finish an interview, literally 19 to 20 seconds later, my show is in MP3 format that I can sort of upload. There's a little bit I have to do after it, but that, that's actually my post-production. So I brought that into it and then I stripped everything else out. And then I thought to myself, okay, if I can deliver that, what else is great for podcasters? And then I thought, how about creating a show that grows momentum without all this promotion as well? So I've been building this into it as well. So we're just about to relaunch on a month course. But the first month is about sort of market research. The second month is about developing your show. Third month is about the recording and the post-production. And then the fourth, sorry, week, I was just saying month, the week actually pulls it all together. Um, and I think that I'm onto something that nobody else has got because I certainly do run my show like nobody else knows. They they are all doing the same thing about create, grow, monetize, where I don't think you have to grow. I think you should create, monetize and grow. And I think if you're providing the right content for someone, that first person that comes to you should at least connect with you or get onto your email opt-in. If you're using the right bait summer and you're providing content that you know somebody is going to want, then they should want more and they should come across to your website. And so I think there's a big mistake in the podcasting fraternity where they think they've got to grow an audience. And I think to yourself, no, just get that one person to come across based on your content. And then the next one, exactly like fishing, you use the right bait to catch the right fish. And that's what I teach. That is such great advice and and so unique to what people are hearing. So thank you for that. Um, you said create, monetize, then grow. Let's talk about monetizing. That's that's a big question. It's obvious to some people. To others, it's, okay, I want to do this podcast. I want to create the content. But how do I monetize it? Yeah. Well, when I started, I thought to myself, right, I'm going to go for the sponsorship route. It seemed easy. So I went off help a lever to grow a big audience so that I could get sponsorship on at the beginning. And then I kind of realized that actually, I don't think I want to do this because if I do have sponsorship, I'm putting all my income into somebody else's hands. What I mean by that is they're saying, yes, I want to sponsor you. And then they'll come along one day and go, oh, no, you're rubbish. I love to get genius with Summer Felix. I'm going to sponsor her and I lose all my income. And I thought, this is too dodgy. I'm not going to do this. I've got to build my income. And then if I put sponsorship on the top, it's, it's a double win. And so that's what I did. I started building communities and it was too much hard work. Every day you was there, you was in Facebook, you were trying to sort of like develop them. And I would have clients and it didn't quite work. And so then I decided I would have the expensive clients. So I went that route and I turned it from a, a non- income production to six figures within about 15 days. And so my wife thought I was a genius businessman. But quite simply, I just had somebody come through to me and I said, yes, 10 grand. I thought no one's going to pay 10 grand. And he said, yes, that's fine. I will do that. And he told his mate and suddenly I had this income. Um, and then this was the, the real bad part of my life. I realized I hated it. I woke up on a Tuesday morning and I thought, what am I doing today? And I thought, oh God, I'm speaking speaking to him. Oh, I really don't <laughs> fancy this. And uh, I looked at it and I'd created this job where I, I wasn't enjoying it. I was just talking to these people about their their kind of boring lives and they were paying me money. But then I would say, right, what I want you to do for next week, we need to do this, we need to do that. And then they'd come back and say, oh no, I, I watched the breaking bad for four days you know that they just wasn't doing anything and it was yeah. sort of really really boring so i thought right no i'm going to create the life that i want and the only way that i'm going to do that is by understanding the nuances of podcasting so i then cut off all my income and went into a mad panic for about about a year really and I started doing other jobs so I worked in like a, a supermarket and um, delivering Indian takeaway or takeout as you say you know in the evenings anything to cover the bills just so that I could have this period in my life of upskilling and knowledge yeah. so that when I came back with something it was impressive and it wasn't just the same old thing that everybody else was doing and uh, and that's what I did and uh, uh, I'm, I'm mightily glad although it almost killed me and it was a bit depressing sometimes times when people would come up to me and go, oh, if you're doing so well as a podcaster, why are you in here? And it was kind of difficult to explain, well, actually, this is part of the plan. This is part of the plan. But I do think with a podcast, you literally, for every person that listens to you per month, you should earn a dollar, a 
dollar off of each person at least. So if you're getting 40,000 40, people listening to you a month, you should be earning 40 grand off of that. And if you're not, you're not marketing well, well enough. And how do you think you can determine that? What are the things that, what are some other th- things that people can be doing with their podcast to monetize besides the sponsorship, like you said? Yeah, the the number one thing, first of all, is speak to their listeners and say, what do you want? Because they're going to tell you. Simple as that. And we all sort of sit here going, right, I'm going to create this brilliant thing and I'm going to throw it out to the market and they're going to love it and they're going to want it. And then they don't. And I don't understand why people don't get people onto an email list, provide good content. And I basically started producing a members only podcast that I would issue as well. So they would opt in and they would get another show called Dream Starters Academy. And I did a year of those um, as the opt in and then say to people, you know, what what would you like from me? If I could make your life easier, what would it be? So I think you can coach. I think that you can um, provide products. I think you can do sponsorship. I think you can write books. There's a myriad of ways of doing it. But the bottom line is you've got to know your audience because it's no point in you thinking that you're a genius, even though your show is called Get Genius, sitting there saying, yes, I'm going to create that because the world's wanting wanting it. That They're not. They're not. And I think that's what podcasters do. They think they have to have this enormous enormous audience, first of all. And I think secondly, uh, it's like one of the people that I was I was training a while ago was a real estate person. And she was selling houses in um, Arkansas, somewhere or other in America. And uh, she said to me, you know, I've only have 15 listeners a week. And she said, but I've sold two houses this week. You know, that's a huge win, a right. financial win. And so she was absolutely delighted with that because she was monetizing and she was speaking the right content for these people. And that's where we fail, I think. Time and time again, we fail. There's a myriad of ways of monetizing, but you've got to ask your audience and you've got to provide the right content. So people people really, I mean, I, I, I know that you agree with this, People need someone in their in their corner, you know, someone that's like either a mentor, a coach, somebody that can help them through um, these type things. You know, it's to to do it completely alone. You can do it, but it it can be challenging. Um, How do you find the right person to work with? For example, if I'm if I'm, you know, I need a coach for my podcast or whatever it is. Maybe it's a it's business as a whole. Maybe it's a specific part of my business. How does somebody go about finding that right person that that's going to be their expert that they can turn to? Well, I think one of the best ways personally is LinkedIn and actually networking, going to conferences. Now, the problem with social media and stuff, you see the highlights. You see, you know, that David Rout's having a wonderful time and he's doing all this and he's doing all that. You haven't seen any of the crap times because I'm unlikely to go, oh, it's terrible today. The kid's thrown up on me. I'm having a, a you know. <laughs> um, but when you go to LinkedIn networking conferences and if you go over there and you write, you know, your town and start entrepreneur networking and stuff and you can do a lot of searches on LinkedIn, you can find these things going on. And it's very difficult that somebody will, you know, lie to you face to face. It's very difficult. You'll just tell from body language that they're not happy with what they're saying. And I always say that to people, if I want to do this, if I want to become a podcaster, if I want to become a a businessman, if I want to do something, get on LinkedIn, find the people in your area and get offline. Don't just sit behind. Um, And I've made mistakes. I've connected with people across the world um, that have come through to me and say, David, I want to be your business partner and stuff. And now I don't accept anyone across the world at all. I, I want to actually meet someone. For example, I've got a new website being designed because my show's kind of outgrown my website massively. And um, I could have gone to anywhere, but I decided on a company five minutes up the road because I could drive up there and actually sit by the side of them and speak to them personally. So I think it's important to get offline to build an online success. What do you think, Summer? I do. You know, I, I agree with that. Um, I'm very much about um, the feeling, the initial feeling that you you get. I do. You know, I believe in intuition and you either you connect with somebody or you don't. So you can also, you know, when you're face to face and you're in the room with them, you you get that vibe. And sometimes, you know, it, it's not that it's, oh, you're, you're not a good person or I don't trust you. Maybe it's not that. It's just knowing whether you're going to actually jive together and that you're going to be able to work with that person. You might meet somebody and realize that they're perfect for somebody else or a different personality that you know. Um, but I do, I do agree with you. It's, it's much, um, it's, it's so much better when you can actually sit next to somebody. I mean, technology is fantastic. 
We've got, you know, you're doing Zoom meetings, you can talk to people on camera, and and there's so many ways to get things done on a day-to-day basis where you can work virtually. But for those really important relationships, it's, it's important to be able to be in the same room with them. You know, you wouldn't marry somebody that you only see virtually, would you? Really? I don't know, you but know. they do it on TV a lot. I mean, there's so many reality shows about that. So. Well, it is, yeah, it's madness. And it's, it it's those madness. people on death, death Row, the serial killers, that yes. end up marrying someone. And I always think, I feel sorry for the boyfriend that she's just dumped. She's dumped this person to go off with the serial killers. It's got no prospects at all. Right. How must he feel? How must he feel? <laughs> he must be so depressed. Yeah, it's crazy. So you do, you do a few different types of coaching, if I'm correct. Um, I'd, I want to hear about, you know, the different types of ways that, that you work with your clients. Well, I don't do a lot of it at all now. As I say, I'm very much in the focus. What, what I did do as well, and I forgot to say this, was in that interim of working and scrabbling around to make money, I had this kind of website that was floating around, which was there before I left my corporate gig. And it was making a little bit of cash. And it's called WhatsApp Florida Keys. And it's a, a website about the Florida Keys. And um, I decided I, I would spend time sort of developing that. Um, it needs a bit more work on it again. But that actually got to the point that pays all my bills and so actually I could stop podcasting now and just just do nothing at all so it gave me a big uh, how can I say it gave me the the confidence to say no to people so instead of going, oh, I need that money, I need that money, I've got to pay the bills, I've got to put the kids through school, I've got to do this or that, this sort of little website that was just floating around, it's total passive income. So I did that. So the only um, coaching that I actually do really is if somebody comes along and wants to pay me absolutely stupid amount of money, which I try my hardest to push them away because it's just boring. I don't do a lot of it. Um, and then we're planning for this this course where I'm planning to do no interaction with anyone for a month. Um and then for a month, I'm going to do this podcasting course four weeks and literally say to the people, you can rip me to shreds. You know, you can ask me anything. Unlimited questions. I will be there absolutely showing you everything I possibly can for that period and then close it off for a month. So I'm planning to do six months on, six months off. And within those six months off, I literally won't turn the computer on. Not one person is going to get me. And I do think if you set your stall out, you know, I had a guest actually called Tim Connolly. I give him a big up. And he said to me that he was a coach and he got this um, business going. And then he used to think, right, I could travel the world doing this. And he'd spend half his time looking for dodgy Wi-Fi in some bar because he had to lift up his laptop and talk to people somewhere across the world. And he thought, I hate this. This this is as bad as being at home. So he then says, right, if you want me, you can have me from March to July. And then after that, you can't have me till October. So all the work's got to be done by that time because then I switch off. And people know that. He set his stall out. He set his standards. And so that's how I operate. I tell people that they're not going to connect by email. If, if you send me an email, I will respond within two weeks. And that's my stall. Um, and everything else has certain standards. Um, and people like Lewis Howes as well. If you go over to his website, which was quite amusing the other day, he literally gives you rules and regulations to get through to him. Yeah. And I think that's 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 the way to do it. I really do think that, you know, we're, we're not we're not Donald Trump. Thank God. <laughs> and got to be on on call 27 hours a day tweeting fake news to everyone you know it's 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 about having a life and nobody ever as i say right at the beginning sets out for the dream of sitting in front of a computer but we right. kind of do it we end up doing it for some reason when life is passing us by and i want the life so what's your per- first piece of advice for somebody who is trying to have that life where they are enjoying every day. I mean, life, life happens. So there's some things you don't enjoy about your day, but that you, you, for the most part are enjoying every day. And while you, while you're still building your, your empire in your terms, whatever that, you know, success is and that empire is, what's the first, what's the first thing they should do? I think get hair restorer, first of all, because I do think that you are going to be stressed out because the upskilling at the beginning, unless you go from an environment that you really know inside out that works very well to create your own business, and I'm sure there's loads of them. So I could have gone into becoming a a public trainer, for example, and I could have done that quite easily, but I didn't want to be traipsing around going to conference centres and stuff and, you know, not seeing the kids. So I do think at the beginning, you've got to say, look, I've got to schedule it. 
I've got to make the extra time and I've got to build it into my routine so that I get something going. After that, you can then start to slow down and be a bit selective. But I think at the beginning, my first bit of advice is you have got to go for this. You know, it's not going to come to you. You've got to really work on it. And if you think you're going to have the same kind of lifestyle and go down the pub three times a, no- a week and, and you know, sit watching Netflix, then forget it because it is all consuming when you get the thing that you want. But once you get past that, then you look back on it and you think, oh, oh my God, I'd do that again. I really would do that again because the dream that I have, which is quite simply, you know, I wake up on a Monday morning and sometimes me and the wife say, oh, let's go to the the movies or the pictures, as we say over here. And we go to the movies and sit there with 65 year olds having cups of tea. And, you know, there's no one else in there. Everybody else is at work, but I'm totally flexible on my time. And I could only get that from the hustle at the beginning. Right. So tell me why people should listen to your podcast. Well, I shouldn't. I should listen to yours, first of all, because yours is a lot, lot better than mine. Good answer. Uh, yeah, they always suck up, always suck up to the host, and it's, it's a big win. Um, why would they come over? It's, it's a different type of show, quite simply. It's not a question and answer show. I literally have never written a question once. I press record, I open my mouth, and what comes out comes out, and sometimes it sounds pretty good, and sometimes it isn't, you know, and it's just a free-flowing conversation. And uh, I think it's, it's engaging for that. And that's the biggest bit of feedback that I get. They never know. Even if it's like similar questions I pose, it's going to be different answers because it's different people. It's a different vibe we create. Um, and that's the only reason. That's the only reason, really, because there's a lot of shows out there. And uh, unfortunately for you and me, that um, Summer, a lot of them are rubbish. You know, I yeah. listen to a, a lot of them and I think, oh, my God, you know, put some enthusiasm in for a start. Get your audio sounding good for a start. You know, base it on radio. You know, radio, you turn it on and it's rarely that it's rubbish sound because they're professional. Podcasting, and I think it's getting better, but podcasters still think that they can just sound like they're recording for a cat that has swallowed the microphone and it's all muffled and stuff. You know, you don't want to do that. But, yeah, I think I think it's a pretty good show to listen to. And there's a lot to choose from because we've done about a thousand episodes as I say. For the record I feel really insecure right now. I'm very self-conscious but that's okay. <laughs> what is that? You're, you have got a good show. You've got a good style and you can do cartoons that's, and, and that's a win for me. <laughs> it is a win. Wait till you see your cartoon. We're going to send you a, a a character of you. You'll love it. I don't, I don't know if we can make you as handsome as, as you are but um, we do a pretty good job. Did I send my picture of George Clooney to you to, to work with? <laughs> Ooh. So I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned your, I want people to be able to find more information about you, find the podcast and all of that. And I know that right now you're at joinupdots.com. Is that the same site that is going to be redone? Uh, yeah, that's the one that's being redone at the moment. Okay. I'm a bit f- fussy about the sort of the way it's being designed, so it's taking a bit longer. Um, and then we've got Podcasters Mastery, which is my other site, which is the training site, and that is going to be relaunched. So it's a closed off site at the moment. They can go and sort of read the content, but that's going to be coming live big time soon. Um, and then I've got other things. I've got Interview Masterclass. I've got the Florida Keys website. I'm a great believer in having loads of things chipping in instead of trying to have all your eggs in one basket. Agreed. Agreed. Is there one spot that links to all of these or can we, should we be giving the different website names? Because I'm going to put this all in the show notes so people can find because they're going to ask, where can I go? As I always say to people, Summer, if you want me hard enough, you'd find me. Do you, do you know what I mean? So, you know, if you go over to Google and you find Join Up Docs, and, and funny, some people have come through to me on sites that are, are even closed up, and I think, how the hell have you found me? But, they, you know, they've, they've made the effort and they've got through. So if you just go to Google or iTunes and um, type in Join Up Docs, that would be a good starting place. All right. Awesome. Well, this has been so much fun. Is there anything that I should have asked you or a cool story that you want to share that I have not asked? Am I officially the sexiest UK podcaster? You could have started with that. Always suck up to the to the guest. That's a good one. I think you missed, <laughs> missed something big there. Um, no, yeah, as I say, you know, I'm open book. You can ask me anything you want, and I will lie about anything you want as well. You know, I, I will make I'll make up any stories you want to sound windswept and interesting. Okay, so I have one final question for you. Who for who was your 
sexiest guest that you've had on your show? Oh, that's a good one. Um, who was the sexiest guest? Um, there was a, a, a man called um, Mark Siebercrop. He was very gorgeous. Um, he's lost his hair now. Um, it, it's funny, actually, you say that. He, I actually, and this is totally confessional. I don't normally say this to anyone. But I actually find myself falling in love with every single female guest that comes on my show. You know, it, it's a real weird feeling that when I'm having these conversations, we're, we're so open and so deep. I, I feel myself falling in love. And at the end, of it i think to myself oh god throw a glass of water over yourself david you know get 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 get, get going this isn't good for your marriage but i think every single female guest i have are the sexiest awesome does your wife listen to the show no she well why she doesn't want to listen to me at home let she's alone like, she's like i already get enough of you all day <laughs> yeah that's that's right it's funny when i first launched my kids used to do that my daughter who was all right about she's 12 now so she's about nine we used to go off on holiday to spain and she used to walk around with her tablet going this is my dad this is my dad to strangers and just sort of playing my show which was good for downloads um <laughs> but now no none of them not one person in my family listens and uh, if i do walk in and i hear myself it's a bit embarrassing do you know what I mean because it's a it's a different version of yourself that you do on the microphone and so I have dad version at home and husband version and then I come over here and I'm all positive podcasting person but you don't want to be doing that in on in the kitchen you don't want to be going yes good morning and would you like a cup of tea please you know (laughs) it, 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 it would just be annoying so no they don't listen at all It's funny. I find that the people that you're closest to, some of your closest friends, closest family members are the people that know the least amount about your work and what you do. Mm. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's right. And my my wife actually says to me, you know, I don't like listening to you because it's not my husband. (laughs) And, you know, I can kind of understand. It's funny, actually, because she actually worked for my company once. She, I I met her at a company and then um, we got married and all that kind of stuff. And then she got a job at the company that I was after and I had to train her. And that was a bit weird as well, because I was up there doing all the big sort of dramatic presentation kind of stuff when she's seen me scratching myself in my underpants that morning. You know, it's (laughs) it's, it's a different world you've got to sort of bridge. So I think family and work, you sort of keep them apart. And certainly, that's what I like to do. I come up to my recording studio at the back of the garden, lock myself away. And then when I go back, it's just who they expect. Yeah, totally. I'm with you. Well, David, this has been super awesome. We definitely got to laugh. Um, Well, we are going to have a link to your website so that everybody can see just how sexy you are. Joinup.com. Join, J-O-I-N, up, U-P, dots, D-O-T-S, dot com. And we will have links to that in our show notes and on blog. Thank you so much, David. It has been an absolute delight, and I hope you will come on my show as a guest, will you? I would absolutely love to. You will cry. And then you, you can say that I have been your sexiest guest. Oh, absolutely. Right, I, I, think, I think that's a given anyway, isn't okay, it? perfect. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's Get Genius. You can learn more about The Draw Shop at www.thedrawshop.com, on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Your home for kick-butt custom whiteboard marketing videos. Your ideas come to life. Thanks for listening. Please share, comment, and make any suggestions for future genius guests.